This week on The Trouble Show, I find out how punk helped to end the Cold War. Auch Kids, die nach irgendwas gesucht haben und äh, rebellieren wollten, ihre Freiheit wollten, die sind einfach raus. Also on this weekend's special program, we're off to Bulgaria to visit an iconic relic of its communist past. Powerful, powerful architecture. And we meet the people in Latvia recreating a good night out, Eastern Bloc style. Wow. Well, I think that'll warm me up. This weekend marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall back in November 1989. Poland was the first Eastern Bloc country to turn its back on communism earlier that year. But those iconic images of the wall coming down here in Berlin really did confirm that the Cold War in Europe was coming to an end. On the evening of November 9th, 1989, the whole world watched the destruction of the Berlin Wall. A structure that divided not just the city, but families, nations and superpowers. Stretching over 80 miles, the wall was built to divide the communist east and the capitalist west. Today, only small sections of it still remain, and crossing it is no trouble at all. Many cultural and political factors contributed to the destruction of the wall, but few captured the mood of the time as much as music. In the West, megastars like David Bowie and Bruce Springsteen both played protest gigs by the partition. But in the East, under the watchful eye of the secret police, an underground scene was forming. It was angry, it was anarchic, and it was a breakaway from control. It was punk music. Chaos was the front man for Wundtenfell, one of the scene's top bands. Auch Kids, die nach irgendwas gesucht haben und äh, rebellieren wollten, ihre Freiheit wollten, wir sind einfach raus ohne Vorschriften, äh, ohne Regeln und hätte mir aber letztendlich nie ausmalen können, was für extreme Konsequenzen das hatte. Im Prinzip alle gegen dich. Die Eltern, die Verwandtschaft, die Gesellschaft. Und die dachten aber auch, wir, denke ich mal, haben vor, das System zu stürzen. East Germany's secret police, the Stasi, regularly targeted defiant anti-authoritarian punks. On multiple occasions, chaos was imprisoned and brutally beaten. Mir dann ein schwarzen Sack über den Kopf gezogen wurde und äh, man hat mich in ein Waldstück gefahren, äh, rausgeholt und drei Mann haben mich zusammengetreten. Ich mit Handschellen und ähm, das war ein Moment, wo ich dachte, die bringen mich jetzt um. 
Es war meine Trotzigkeit, mein, mein unbedingter Wille, mir einfach nichts vorschreiben zu lassen. Back then, the intense scrutiny of the Stasi meant that gigs often had to be held in the unlikeliest of locations. This is the place. Wow, this is pretty spectacular. Yeah, it's a church. <laughs> I can't imagine hundreds of punks coming to a church for a concert. Yeah, but hundreds of beer. Hat nur die Kirche dir einen gewissen Schutz und Räume zur Verfügung gestellt. Es würde einfach zu viel Aufsehen erregen, würde man in einer kirchlichen Einrichtung damals auch schon Leute verhaften, zuführen, prügeln oder sonst was. What was the vibe and the energy like in here? Es war lustig. Einerseits war natürlich eine ganze Menge Punks, die wussten, es ist ein Konzert dort. Aber es waren natürlich auch viele Hippies, Langhaarige und Leute aus der jungen Gemeinde da, inklusive der Facher. Und ich sag mal, die wussten am Anfang noch nicht, auf was sie sich da einlassen. When you think about those times, those difficult times during the GDR period where you were intimidated by the Stasi and the, the, the problems that you had amongst the people in the streets. Would you do it again? Absolut. Das war für mich die härteste, aber auch schönste Zeit. Punk was the soundtrack to an era of mounting defiance against the GDR, an era that culminated with the destruction of the war. Now, 30 years on, this underground history is finally surfacing. In the aptly named punk bar, Kircher von Unten, or the Church from Underground, a band is rehearsing for Ostart, a two-day festival taking place this weekend, designed to pay tribute to the subculture that provided a lifeline for so many. Ostart is a festival in Berlin um, in order of the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's a good chance to, to, to get the younger people in touch with the, with the history in the end. It's not like a I have to read some books or whatever, you can feel it. For me, the real punks were in the GDR, not in the Western, because they had really to deal with repression, police, and it, it was really a big thing to do this there. The stakes were much higher for, <laughs> for, for the punks in, in the GDR. Yeah. Today's been really surprising and it makes me think of what it must have been like in this city on the night that the Berlin Wall came down, the energy that must have crackled through it and how much of that energy was driven by punk music. But you know what else is also cool is the fact that the next generation here are putting on events like the Ostart Festival, which is helping to keep the memory alive of that counterculture, the counterculture of punk music that had to fight so hard just to exist. Now this weekend, there are dozens of anniversary events taking place all over Berlin. But if you're planning a trip later than that, don't worry, because there's still plenty of things to see and do. At the new Time Ride Berlin, you have the chance to tour a VR recreation of the former divided city. Following a walkthrough exhibition, you can board a bus all the way back to the 1980s, taking in GDR landmarks like Checkpoint Charlie and the old parliament, the Palace of the Republic or you could explore some of the incredible tunnels that helped over 300 East Berliners escape under the wall. The Berliner Unterwelten Museum hosts exhibits and tours, 
but being underground, their accessibility is limited. November also sees the planned completion of the Berlin Handshape Project, a collection of almost 11,000 clay moulds, one for each day since the wall came down. Berlin Handshape Project is um, shown at the Documentation Centre at the Bernauer Straße. It's bringing two people together and ask them to shake hands and in this handshake we put a ball of clay your other hand you can also so we squeeze, squeeze. it open up open up and this is a beautiful handshake look at that wow and out of 11,000 of these handshakes we build a wall of unification we have the prototype here and in the future there will also be something outside that people can see it Still to come on The Travel Show. Coming up, we've got more from two former Eastern Bloc countries who are forging a new future 30 years on, but still remember their past. So don't go away. Well, if you come to Berlin, you'll find some parts of the Berlin Wall standing and being used as backdrops for tourist selfies. But across the former Eastern Bloc, there are other buildings and structures that nobody quite knows what to do with. Maybe because their history is still too raw and some countries aren't so comfortable confronting their past. A few years ago, we sent Mike to Bulgaria to take a look around an iconic building that was left abandoned when the communist regime collapsed. I'm excited. <laughs> Woo, it's been a long time yeah, I've wanted to come here. Wow. It is massive, isn't it? At 70 meters high and 60 meters wide, Buzlaja looks out across the Balkan mountains. Completed in 1981, it was built as an iconic national monument to glorify the Communist Party. It's here because this was the birthplace of the Bulgarian Socialist Movement. It, this is powerful, powerful architecture. Following the collapse of the regime, the building was abandoned and later shut off to the public as it fell into disrepair. Recently, the only people to have seen inside have been a select group of photo-hungry urban explorers who have broken in illegally. This is a really big deal today. The Travel Show is the first international TV crew to be allowed in the front doors of Busuja. So we are very excited, we are very lucky to be able to do so. And now's the time. You ready? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, wow. Here it is. this. Me first? Welcome. It's seen better days, hasn't it? <laughs> Definitely. It costs the equivalent of $35 million in today's money to build Buzlaja. Since it was abandoned, the years, they haven't been kind. Dora, it's, it's incredible. There's some work to do, obviously, okay. but it's still very impressive. Look at these 50 square meters of mosaics right on top. There is the symbol of communism actually with wood hammer and sickle and you can read in Cyrillic around it, workers from the world unite. So there's a mosaic on the ceiling but the entire perimeter is also covered in mosaic. We have actually more than 1,000 square meters of mosaic inside Buzluja. Out of all of these, which one is your favorite? Over there is people defeating a dragon. And the dragon should represent the capitalism, monarchy, and the fascism, all the enemies of communism. And it's defeated by the communist people. When the monument opened, thousands came from all over the country to marvel at its beauty. There were sound and light shows and talks from well-known communist artists and poets. One person who remembers that time well is Bedros Azinian. He and his father were the official photographers for the building. 
Bedros, you were here and you saw this room in this building when it was at its best. What was that like? Беше величествено. Беше изключително светло и привличаше погледа именно с странната архитектура, която имаше. Аз даже искам да ти покажа една снимка, която носа с себе си. И оттам се виждаше тогава ето това. Really all that's left is the mosaics and the mosaic in the ceiling. Here and here, the rest, all of this white is now how gone. And what do you feel seeing what it's become? Аз съм влизал в този паметник през 10 години и наистина всеки път като идвам оставам удивен от това, че просто е допуснато това нещо така. Тази красота, която виждаме тук на тази снимка, по този начин да бъде унищожено. Time could be running out for Bustaja. If the roof collapses, the walls will go too and the building will be lost. There's now an urgent debate about what exactly to do with the money. Those who remember the repressions and the hardships of the communist era would like to see it destroyed. Others want to restore it to its former glory. But Dora is working on a proposal to preserve it as a museum and a place where Bulgarians can discuss the past. It was built to represent and glorify the communist idea. And we don't want to do this nowadays. We just want to know the history, we want to, to, to understand why it was built. But if we keep it intact um, and uh, let leave the symbols in their present condition, I think this will be much more powerful and meaning for the next generation to understand. It'll be a symbol of much more than just like it was communism. It's more a symbol of Bulgaria and the ups and downs and the roller coaster the country's been through. There's no doubt that this is a controversial but very powerful and iconic building. And because of that alone, to me, it feels worth preserving in whatever form. But ultimately it's down to Bulgaria itself to work out how it remembers its past going into the future. Well, to finish this week, we're off to Latvia. It's a country that turned its back on the old Soviet Union and won its independence back in 1990. But although it successfully made the transition from communism to capitalism, some people are still kind of nostalgic for certain elements of the old days, as Krista found out when she visited the capital Riga earlier this year. The Russian bear still projects its shadow over the tiny country. But it's also part of its DNA. About one in four Latvians are ethnic Russian. And Imans is one of them. A few years ago, he opened a bar for those nostalgic for their youth under the Soviet regime. And it had to include one of Latvia's most popular games, the Novus. Will you show me? I must hit that one and yeah. hit those yeah, yeah. into the pockets. I mean, this is be embarrassing. We we'll wait for this. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll leave it to the professionals now. I think. Uh, Такого плана кафе были во многих районах Риги. Это было место, где люди вечерами встречались, общались и разговаривали. Изначально как бы мы думали, что концепция будет для более среднего и более стар, старшего возраста. Но на сегодняшний момент у нас приходит очень много молодежи, которые хотят увидеть, как отдыхали по вечерам их родители. So we've got all sorts of Soviet goodies here. Uh, it used to be served up during that era. We've got salami, uh, cheese, herring, and sprat with egg all served on bread. And it used to come like this. So you would order 100 ml of vodka, and one of these snacks would come as standard, just to make sure you didn't get too drunk. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and Latvia regained its independence. Finally enjoying the freedom to travel and settle abroad, 
many young Latvians chose to leave. Riga has lost almost a third of its population since independence. A consequence of this exodus is that it's left an extraordinary number of buildings across the city empty, like this one, a former ambulance depot. But one group of activists is trying to change this. I was one of the founders of this uh, initiative in 2013. Working with owners and the municipality, Free Riga turns derelict buildings into social and cultural venues. So what do we have here now? So this is a street food place and uh, over there there is a bar with a concert venue. Then there is a co-working and, and there are artist residences. You've got everything here. What and, don't you have here? <laughs> Hotel. <laughs> no hotel yet, okay. So tell me about some of the events that you hold here, mostly during the summer, I guess. It's a bit cold at the moment. Mm. These are all, all kind of activities, starting from concerts, exhibitions, workshops. Yeah, the building looks a little bit rough, so the atmosphere is more, how do you say, not rough, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> more, more, maybe easy, more easy going. Yeah, more informal, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe this will become a, a new Berlin or something. <laughs> Going into the bar next door, there's definitely a Berliner vibe in the air. Only the drinks are local. I have a black Bolson, please. It's a very little one. Sure. Wow. Well, I think that'll warm me up. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, that's your lot for this week. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media to keep up with us on all our adventures. But until next time, from me, Adia Deputan, and all the Travel Show team here in Berlin, it's Alvida Says. Oh,